this day the opportunity to have morning manna. I thank you for every individual on this call, and I thank you for the opportunity, amen, that's given us this season, this time. Lord, thank you. Hey, man, we, we on a mission up in here today, and we give you the praise. We give you the glory. Lord, give me clarity. Give me articulation of speech, God. Allow me. You know I have a problem sometimes going a little fast. Help me to relax, calm down. And, and, and I got tomorrow to teach. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> ah. You know, one of the main things you got to pray for is you got to pray to overcome your humanity. I don't know if you do that in your prayer, but you know yourself and you got to pray that God will help you not be a problem for yourself. But listen, Man, so good to see everybody. I wish I could just talk to everybody individual. I mean, I'd like to just have a sit down, but this is kind of like that because today we're starting. Well, actually we have started, but we are really going into depth into the Bible. And that is what we are going to do. This year is going to be the most informative year of your life. And uh, I've really come to realize that uh, my number one purpose is to make sure you understand the Bible. That I'm going to have to give an account to God for what I taught you. And I want I'm going to be judged. You know, I'm going to get evaluated and I'm going to be judged on how knowledgeable you are of the scriptures. Clearly, it's going to be a situation. I got to give an account. He's going to like say, them. God's going to ask me, say, you know, did you teach them what I told you? And did you do, do they understand? And, and I really take you personally. I take my job very seriously because I am going to be judged. I'm going to have a performance evaluation. And the question is going to be, the people who listen to you, do they know the scriptures? Do they know the truth? And so for that reason, I, mean, I have a new purpose per se in the sense that this is my aim. And I intend every time I come before you, I want to leave you shaking your head saying, man, I didn't know that. Oh, so that's what that meant. Or that's what, that's what we're aiming for. And so with that being said, I hope you had an opportunity to do your assignment because your assignment was to read Genesis, the first chapter through the uh, 11th chapter. And uh, if you didn't, don't worry. You can always read it later. But uh, if you read the assignment before class, it'll you'll, you'll get more than if you if you had. I mean, you some of y'all are really smart. You'll pick up stuff, but but it's always good to have read what we're gonna cover because there are things the Holy Spirit's gonna reveal to you that I'm not gonna say. But somehow or another, because you read it, he's going to bring all things to your remembrance. And so let's get involved with this, because I need you to understand the spirit, the purpose, the overall, was the word, summary of what we're talking about in Genesis, the 11, or first 11 chapter. Now, first and foremost, I need to tell you that this is a part of what we call the Pentateuch. And the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. And we need to understand whenever we read the scriptures, who the scriptures were written to and for what purpose that scripture was written. And that right there is the key element to understanding what that scripture uh, means because the meaning is tied to the purpose. And so what we have here in, um, in the Pentateuch is we have something that was written after the children of Israel had come out of Egypt, okay? 
The Pentateuch, most scholars believe it was written by Moses. Um, but they make too much to do about that. Man, just leave us alone with who wrote and all that. Moses wrote, okay, just take my word. So anyway, um, what happened was, was that the children of Israel had come out of Egypt. The children of Israel had um, been delivered from um, years of slavery. They had spent 400 years in Egypt. And um, now they were out. And now God had saved them, brought them out. And so the problem is that them being in Egypt all those years, and then experiencing the salvation that came by way of God delivering them. In some ways, they they uh, they were cut off. I mean, they knew God had delivered them and had made them and declared them to be His people, but they didn't really know what happened prior to that. They they didn't know. Okay, what happened before this? You see, they, they were kind of, um, you know, I want to say confused, but they didn't know the significance. They didn't know the importance. They didn't know what this was all about. And most of all, they didn't know the God that had delivered them. It's like, it's like us. We get saved. And and instantaneously we know God, but we don't really know Him, and that's the we we have to learn Him, and so that's very important. It's very important to understand that the that the first five books, and specifically the first three, um, first eleven, first eleven verses are about bringing them up today. Helping them to understand, okay, how do we get here? Okay, we we are the children of God. You know, Moses then told us that, you know, God has saved us and we've experienced these miracles. But what was going on before this? And how do we get here? You know, the definition of being lost is when you get cut off from where you've been. Because if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you are. You know where you are from where you've been. And you can't know where you're going if you don't know how you got here. Your location is tied to where you're headed. And so all of us been lost before. All of us been on the road. And we can't really say, where in the world am I? And you have to retrace your steps so that you can know where you are juxtaposition to where you're trying to go. So think of first 11 chapters of um, Genesis being just that. Okay. Okay. Who is this God that uh, delivered us from Egypt? And, uh, and, and what was going on before he decided to save us? And so that's why this is very important because it's like a situation where God was showing them who they are and, and time and getting them connected to what they had come from. And so first and foremost, they needed to know how did all this start? Where is the beginning of time? When did all of this start? And he had Moses to write this in the scriptures. And it's very important. And I got away from my notes. So let me make sure I, it's, that way I can make sure I cover what I'm supposed to cover. That's <laughs> why I get excited. But anyway, it was very important for them to understand um, their heritage. And to know why. why. Why did God save them? What was his aim? It was important for them to know that uh, who is this God? So 
God reveals in those first 11 chapters all the stuff. Now, let me just say this. It's so good. I just got fit. Tried to meet her before we got started. I had a great conversation with her because I was sharing with her because she has some questions because, you know, there's certain things that seemingly are left out. When you read the first 11 chapters, I mean, there's some things like, well, how did that, where did these people come from? And, what did, and how does this have it done? And so there is an element where you need to understand that, that the Bible is not a history book. It doesn't give you every uh, sequential piece of information of everything that happens. I mean, there are people that come up in the Bible while you're reading. You say, well, where did they come from? And who was their father? And who? The, because really, it's not about necessarily giving you every detail of what happened sequentially, but it's more about helping you to understand what it is you are to believe. And if you understand that, you won't get confused and you won't chase after no wild, no wild goose chase. Because anything that's not revealed is not significant. It's not important to you believing in God. And there's enough that is clear. There's enough that is significant. And if you focus on that, you'll be fine, okay? But all this try to go all around Joe's, that's a part of just the distraction that can happen. And as I said, everything is not spelled out. And it's not unusual because that's the way God is. God doesn't reveal everything. Look, let me explain something to you. None of us know what God is doing, okay? Anybody that tells you they know exactly what's in the mind of God and how you exactly is lying. God tells you all that he needs you to know, and then you walk in that. Okay, and if you stand around waiting for him to explain stuff before you move forward, you ain't gonna never go nowhere. But that's the part of our faith. And I think that's the greatest part of our faith is that we trust him and we don't know everything. He doesn't reveal everything. He does not show you everything, but he expects you to follow what he has revealed. And that comes down to the trust that he's legitimate, that he's always right. And even though it doesn't seem sometimes like he know what he's doing, or it seems like this ain't going the way you thought, that's the part about trusting him because he orders your steps and he leads you. So that's what I want to start off with. I want you to understand that this is about these, I guess you could say new people in terms of just now discovering about God who spent all this time, like I said, in Egypt. And uh, I mean, that's all they've ever known. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure there was some that were teaching about God, but for a very large portion, they were ignorant of, well, who they were what they've been called to do. Because see, one of the things you have to understand is that is that this is 11 chapters. It's only 11 chapters. And yet it uh, covers thousands and thousands of years. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that happened that's almost like skipped over. And then when you get to chapter 12, you find that Genesis is mostly about Abraham. We go to the patriarchal period, we call it. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Joseph, the most of the next to Abraham. That's, that's the book of Genesis. You say, well, how come it left out? You put all that time in 11 chapters, and then you put that much time with things slow down, and that's a smaller period of time. Like I said, Bible ain't sequential. But the reason is, is because the purpose of the first 11 chapters of Genesis is just to help them understand what happened before Abraham. Because these are the descendants of Abraham. It was in 
chapter 12, which we'll talk about when we get there, when God shifted, God decided, hmm, I'm going to reveal myself through Abraham and his seed. That's when Abraham was chosen and his seed would be chosen to be the revealers and the source of God revealing himself to the world. God looked at all of, all of the human beings in the world and he said, hmm, I'm going to use this group and I'm going to operate through this group. Okay. Now, this group, they don't know that. I mean, they don't understand that, right? And so chapters 1 to 11 are to explain that to, to them, what happened before. And starting with creation. You got to start with creation. First of all, hmm, uh, who is this God? Who is this God that called Abraham and that has set us apart to be used of God? Well, a novel concept, something that at the time was earth shaking, was different. Our God is the only God. It's called mafia, monotheism. Our God is the one God. They're not different ones. Now, this to us is pretty normal. Oh, you yeah, ain't but one God. But back then, it wasn't. Because back then, each nation had their God. And each nation had their version of God. And some people had God being, you know, some particular image. I mean, like a lion or the head of this, some kind of you know, being or stuff. They had different, the Greek gods, you know, and all these different ideas about who God was and God this and God that. It was amazing and nothing short of revelatory that the God of this group of people, you got to think of it, realize that, the, that this, this group of people was not the largest group of people. It wasn't the greatest group of people. I mean, this group of people were not necessarily distinguished as the biggest nation in the world and nothing like that. But God, he chose them. He picked, he said, I didn't pick y'all because y'all were the most numerous or y'all was most powerful. I picked you because I picked you. And, and the fact that I picked you is going to bring attention to my greatness, not your greatness. That's just like, a, you know, you can't really say you all that. But when people look at you, they're amazed, like, whoa. And they know it ain't you. They know it's got to be the God that you serve. We have this treasure. Earth and else. I digress. But my point is, and I hope you follow me today, that God gave the revelation of who he was as the creator God, as the almighty God, as the all powerful God. They had, it came along with a belief about God where they said that he is the God. Okay, they're not other gods. Different nations, whatever. Like if you go to Babylon or if you go, they, you come under their jurisdiction. And their God. Matter of fact, they used to think when well, you fight a war, it was your God fighting against another war. And I, I, we showed the mastery of our God because we beat you. And I was, but, but the Jewish, the uh, descendants of Abraham, God revealed himself. And that's why we have the Genesis uh, narrative. Because God wanted them to know that I am the God that made all this. We serve the almighty God, the creator God. Amen. We serve, people say, well, how can he do that in six days? That's irrelevant, okay? And 
Yeah, he can do anything he wants because he is he is almighty, omnipotent. He can do anything he wants. And let me just chase one little rabbit. I always tell you when I'm, well, I don't always tell you, but I should tell you when I'm chasing a rabbit. But I want you to understand that this is a novel idea at that time. But it was very important for the people of God, specifically these ex-slaves, to know who their God was. Now, he had shown himself to be powerful over the Egyptians, especially with the plagues. And because the plagues were all about one thing. The plagues was uh, God showing his mastery over all the gods of the Egyptians. Because like I said, the Egyptians believed in all of these things. They believed in the God of the frogs and the God of the different you know, plagues that came up. And the biggest God was the God of death. And that's why, you know, he said, put the blood on the, on the doorpost. Because God was revealing to his people, his mastery. That was important. We don't hear a lot about that, about the plagues. But that was a very important thing. Because if you're going to follow me, you need to know who I am. And you need to know that I'm greater than the God you've known or you've heard about or people have told you about. I need you to understand they're not gods. I'm the, I, and when I decide to do something, I, ch I, don't, I, I don't have anybody that can check me. I do what I choose to do. And his mastery with the plagues was, to, was indeed intended, intended to do that, okay? Because when you go out and I tell you to do something, I don't need you worried about, oh, I might run into the such and such a God, or I might run into the such. So I want to show you, and I'm not just going to take you out of Egypt. I'm, I'm going to show the Egyptians, and I'm going to show you with your master of Egypt. That's why even the Red Sea, the Red Sea wasn't just about rescuing them. The Red Sea was, he said, I'm going to get me more glory. And the Egyptians who you see, you'll see them no more. Well, what was that about? Well, that was about him showing them that I'm going to erase your regard, your respect, your fear. You see, you can be out of a place, but still be bound by that place because you're still intimidated by that place and by those people and have been under their, uh, you're under them all those years and being abused and controlled in their mind, mentally, all that kind of stuff. God had to do something to sever. He said, the Egyptians who you see today, you won't see them no more. I'm, I'm severing. And I, I want to show you my master, who I am. I'm, I'm the God who's greater than all the gods you have known or heard about. And uh, and so that's, let's start right there. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's my introduction. And so we start with God created. Now, it makes perfect sense. I mean, really. Anybody with common sense can know that all of this was not just falling together. I mean, I can't think of nothing more ludicrous than the idea that the world just evolved out of nowhere. I mean, all this stuff just happened. I mean, you can just look around with common sense and know things how things are constituted and how orderly everything is to know there's a mind behind it. I mean, come on, man. What, what does Psalm say? A fool said in his heart, there is no God. I mean, the greatest proof of the existence of God is the fact that everything is so orderly. Everything is in perfect place. And don't get me started on that one. But let me just illustrate for you. I mean, come on now. So you mean to tell me that uh, the earth spins on its axis, okay, 24 hours, and then it leans toward the sun and has just enough uh, distance so that it doesn't burn up because it's not too close and it doesn't freeze up because it's not too far and that it circles the sun and that wind is blowing to distribute 
the heat energy throughout. I mean, it has the ozone layer that deflects the harmful rays of the sun. I mean, you mean to tell me that just kind of just evolved? I mean, it just happened out of nowhere. I mean, nobody really was thinking about that. Nobody really was was planning that. Nobody laid that and put that in place. I mean, and this has been going on for centuries. This has been happening. There hasn't been any lapse. There hasn't been any break in it. I mean, wow. So you're going to tell me, people say, I'm an atheist. I mean, you're a fool. I mean, how in the world can you walk around and breathe in air? Or take your body, for example. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, think about how you're designed. You have an immune system to keep you from getting sick. I mean, you have a breathing apparatus. I mean, you you have uh, nerves and cells. I mean, so you mean to tell me that just happened, you know, one time it just seemed like something was in the water and came out the water and started walking. And then, and then all of a sudden we just developed. I mean, you take something like the human brain. I mean, it has billions of neurons. It's so all that stuff is caught. So all that just no, there was a divine mind behind all that that created all of that. That that design. I mean, I'm being facetious right now. For some of y'all driving in a car, you came here. I mean, you're gonna get some of you in a car now, or you aren't gonna get in the car, drive to work or whatever go to the store, whatever. Now, when you get in that car, I mean, wouldn't it be preposterous for you to suggest that maybe when you're in that car, oh, this car evolved? I mean, at one point, it was just a bumper. And then over a thousand years, it grew into wheels. And then after that, it got a carburetor. I mean, then it was like, it, was like it, just, it just happened. And it happened to be designed so you could sit in it and you can turn the ignition on. Come on, man. You would say that's crazy, Pastor D. You are cocoa, cocoa pops. Because all you got to do is look at that car and know somebody designed that car. Some engineer sit down and put this there, put that there, and make it like this and that, like that. Of course, it break down on you in a minute. I mean, you know, a car will break down on you at the worst time. I mean, a car will get you, man. I don't care whether it's new or old. But, you know, that's the limitation of humanity with that. But God shows his mastery. He reveals who he is by his creation. His creation declares the glory of our God. That's why it's critical. It's very important that we start the Bible with creation. We start the Bible with probably the most obvious indication of who he is, how great he is, how much he is to be worshiped and served, respected and regarded because nature, and, and I hope like you, I hope you do this periodically. You go where there's a mountain or you go where there's a beach or you go somewhere where there's just beautiful scenery. You, you look and just, engage in the spirit of just awe and just engage in just how wonderful and beautiful. Get out of the city. I mean, stop one right look at the skyscraper. That's the man. You need to see. Hey, look, because the heavens declare the glory of God. And psychologists have even come up with this concept where they call it the, the spirit one of them, they don't say spirit, but they call it the awe. That they're, they're, we have this thing where we can we can be in awe. And they say that it's something that's very, very healthy. And it's something that allows us amen, to like, our body reacts to it. And that's because we were created to worship God. I got to find that article. I'm going to get y'all a copy of it. It talks about how that. They're encouraging people to go places and to just engage in like focusing on some beautiful place or whatever, 
And, uh, you know, don't go on vacation, just be running around doing all, no, find a place where there is a mountain, find a place where there is some beautiful ocean. Man, you should, it's something hypnotic about that water coming in and that water going out, just sit there staring. Do that and tell me you won't feel God. You won't experience God. You won't sense the awe of our God. I digress, I'm so sorry. But it makes all the sense in the world that God would begin by telling them that in the beginning, God created everything. Everything can be tied, as I said, to one God. He is not five, six, seven, or like the such and such God, the God of the ocean, or the God in the mountain. No, 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 no. There's one. And it's like I said, it's an amazing concept because at the time when uh, Moses was writing this, that was not the common belief in the ancient world. Ancient world was that, you know, the whole lot. And even now, it's amazing. Do you know that's coming back? This belief in all these different gods? Like, for example, Hinduism. Hinduism doesn't believe in one God. Hinduism has millions and thousands of different gods. And there are different gods that have different um, purposes and goals and all of that. Hinduism, you know, Buddhism is a, it comes from out of Hinduism. As a matter of fact, you know, yoga is really the interaction with all these different gods. That's why don't do that, okay? Don't do not do yoga, all right? Because that you're talking to a Hindu god. You're a Christian, okay? You don't do that, all right? I know it makes you feel peaceful. Well, you can meditate on the word, okay? <laughs> I mean, we even got stuff like that in church. I mean, we have a yoga group at the church, and then when we meet on Tuesday, get that out of your church. <laughs> I got to be careful. Somebody will get mad. Well, get mad, whatever. But I want you to understand that uh, God is a creator, God. And so, as I said, Moses wanted to make it perfectly clear to these believers that number one, the God that saved you, the God that delivered you out of Egypt, the God that's called you apart is not a God. He is the God. The second thing that's very, very important about this creator God is to understand that you have a purpose. You have a significance. You are not just another group of people in the world. You need to understand you're God's chosen people. You are called for a purpose. In you, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. That's what he told Abraham. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. We'll get to that later. But I want you to understand that they have been slaves. There is something about the indoctrination of being slaves. All African American people who came here and were part of slaves can relate to this. All of us can relate to this. Because one of the things that people do to you in order to control you and in order to use you and in order to keep you submission, it was not just the uh, institution of slavery, it was the indoctrinization of your mind because it was a great money-making enterprise. Let me tell you something. America became rich because unlike any other place in the world at the time, they had free labor. And don't let nobody tell you anything other than the fact that if it had not been slavery, we would not have had an industrial revolution. We would have not been able to become the nation that we are. So this idea that black people need to go back to Africa, no, 
Black people made America because it was slave labor and the fact that we were working without being paid, which allowed this country to have infrastructure, bridges, canals, and to have a system. And the insurance money made off of slavery, all these big time companies, these Fortune 500 countries, companies, if you look at how they got their money, they got their money as a result of the insurance and, and um, from slavery. And let me explain to you, stop thinking that it was the South and all that. No, most of the money on slavery was coming and was made in the North, okay? It was made in the same people that were fighting on the Union forces and they were fighting, not just so we could be free, but they was fighting over the money. And the South had was fighting to keep slavery in place. Not because it was helping the Eric Day person there. I'm getting out of my subject. But anyway, you know, I was a history teacher, my bad. <laughs> but my point is that even though they were out of slavery, even though they were no longer slaves to Pharaoh, Okay, they were cut off from that, their special purpose. They were descendants of Abraham. And even though they had been ex slaves, they need to understand they have a special role, a special role in the world, a special role in the narrative of God's purpose. It's important to connect this great God that created everything, that is the source of everything. It's very important for them to connect themselves to that God. We are his people. We are, we're not ex-slaves. We're children of the most high God. I mean, this is like, this is very important. It's very important for you to know the narrative is that you have been in the short term ex-slaves. But before this, your real identity is that you are the chosen people of God. And that's why, I, I, excuse me, I keep using the same illustration, but you know, that's why African American people see his black our history is not just what happened in the Civil War. I mean the Civil Rights Movement. I mean it's great Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, but no, you gotta go back to Africa. You gotta go back to the to the original uh designers of civilization. You got to realize that the everything originated from Africa and the Genesis narrative will bear this out because where was the Garden of Eden? It clearly says there were these four rivers and the first river mentions is Havia and that's it as it says right there in the scriptures, Ethiopia, okay? And even though the furthest river is the Tigris, which people associate that with being more over in Iran and Iraq, it still was African because everybody at that point that lived there was African because that was considered at that time a part of Africa. And you got to realize that the, that the Middle East didn't become these other races till much later, okay? Which I think about my professor. Dr. Kane Hope felt that that was my professor at Howard Divinity School. I mean, the great, that's so funny. I was there two years after he came. I was, I was like, God put me right there and under him. And, you know, he, he trouble, troubling biblical waters. That's what was his book. If you ever get a chance to read that. But basically, that's what he does. He went through that. He explained that the people in the Bible were black people. Don't let me digress. But my point is, understand Genesis, the first chapter, the 11th verse, 
has to do with being written to a people who didn't know their history, didn't know their narrative, didn't know how they had come to be and had been misled and had been um, deceived about who they were. And it was about God showing them that you're my people. And because you're my people, you're special. You're called. You have a purpose. You say, well, what? Pastor Steve, why are you going through all of this? Well, because you got to understand that we in the church as the believers of Jesus Christ, I mean, we're carrying out that purpose. As a believer, as a Christian, you got to realize something. You're special, okay? You are the lights of the world. You can't have no low self-esteem and you can't think of yourself as just being here by accident. You are on assignment and your assignment is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's why every place you are, you're by divine appointment. And you are here because you're the salt of the earth. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, to show forth the praises of him that call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I need you to, I need you to take stock in the fact that who you are, because who you are is tied to whose you are, and that you have been set apart for a meaning, for a purpose. This was very important for them. So when you have the first book of the Pentateuch, you know, the first thing Moses emphasized is that God, who the heavens and heavens cannot contain, has selected and chosen you. And I think you need to understand just from a general perspective that, you know, blessings are never just about you. They're always generation. Okay? You are walking in the blessing of your ancestors. I go so far and say that a lot of the prayers that people have for you, your forefathers and your parents, grandparents, you're walking in the blessing and some of the prayers they had are being fulfilled in you. And not only that, but you are praying and are being blessed with things that are not even going to be fulfilled in your lifetime, but going to be fulfilled in your children. I just chased one rabbit. Man, I went down to North Carolina on AT, and I went down there, and that diamond should kind of mangle in front of this, on this major platform, the Ronald McNair commemorative luncheon. She was the keynote speaker. She got up there and talked in front of all them people. Man, I was looking around the room. My eyes were like tearing up because I'm like thinking, is this my child up here? And then she just waxed eloquent. Man, the, the, she got up there, man, and gave that speech. But I, I couldn't hardly, I was trying to tape the whole thing. <laughs> I hardly hold it up because I wanted to wipe my eyes. But I was like, shit. And I was just sitting there, and the Holy Ghost said to me, she said, look, this ain't about what's happening right here. This is the prayers of your mother. This is the prayers of your father, the prayers of your grandfather. She is walking in blessings, walking in things. So I'm going to tell you something. You can't stop thinking about this just about, you know, your life, your life. You are walking in the fulfillment. And what Genesis is talking about is the fact that y'all think y'all just got delivered from the Egyptian bondage just because God was just trying to help y'all because y'all have, have a hard time. You don't understand this is according to a promise that God had made to Abraham. This is a promise that God gave Abraham that he was going to bless his seed. You couldn't stay no slaves. You couldn't keep being mistreated. You couldn't be destroyed by the Egyptian host. 
you weren't blessed because of what you did and what happened in your life. This You're being blessed by a promise that was made to the, the founder, the patriarch. I'm going to get to that when I start doing patriarchy. It was the promise that was made to him that God is fulfilling. And I want you to understand. Let me just <clears throat> let me just say one thing. Let me tell you. So I need you to stop worrying about what's going on currently. And I need you to stop having amnesia in the sense that all you focused on is what you have done in your life and what's happening in your life and what's going on right now. I need you to understand you are tied to a narrative and you're tied to a blessing. And you're tied to something that's running in your family. Your family bloodline is that the promises that God has made to those, amen, who've gone on before you, amen. We have this great cloud of wit. I need you to connect. That's what this is all about. I need you to connect your present and circumstance and situations to the overall narrative, not just of yourself, but of God's call on you and on your family, and you have an assignment. You know what? You are a part of the repairs of the breach, and God is using you to pave a way, hallelujah, so that people can find future generations. I need you to start seeing your significance. I need you to start realizing that I've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. I need you to start thinking at this little bit of whatever issues I'm having in my life, things I'm dealing with. Let me tell you something. Some of you are on assignment to end cancer in your bloodline. Some of you are on assignment to be the one, amen, who opens the door for financial prosperity for future generations. Some of you are here because as a result of your run, amen, you're making it so that those that come behind you are blessed. And it's not just what you are doing and what happened this is about a bigger picture, a broader picture. Moses wanted the people of God to understand that this, oh shoot, my time go. But look, hold on, I gotta jump. I gotta jump, man, because I gotta cover this. I gotta, um, gotta help you understand that Genesis has everything to do with understanding how we got here. How did we get here? And we have to know what happened before we got here. And we need to understand why is the world messed up? I mean, why do we have all of these issues? Why, why are things so whack? Was it always like this? If you notice in the creation narrative, everything God did, he said, it was good. Everything he did, after he did, he said, and it was good. Well, what happened? If it was all good, how come now there's so much bad? Well, sin, it boils down to one thing, S-I-N. Well, what's sin? Well, sin is the violation of God because it's not enough for you to know who your God is and know you're special. It's critical that you understand that you have to serve, know, follow, obey God. And it started when man who was created and put in this paradise, he sinned. You say, well, why is that so important? Because that is the bottom line. It boils down to our relationship with God must be a relationship where we do not sin. And I tell you, I was supposed to be talking about that the whole time. But I'm happy about what I talked about. But I want you to realize your greatest threat is sin. And this is important because they hadn't got the law. God had not 
given them the commandments. I mean, that hadn't quite happened yet. But I need you to understand that sin didn't start when God gave you the law and laid out what's right and wrong. Sin started at the very beginning where Adam, the first man, got in trouble because God told him something and he did not do it or he did the opposite. And that is why they went out of whack. Now your role is going to be I'm going to use you to show the world that they should serve and obey and follow. I'm going to use you to set you apart as an example to the world for how you are to relate to God. I am holy and you will be holy. That is how God is going to reveal himself to others as to a holy people and make no bones about it. What makes you unique as a child of God is you have his ways. You are clean, you are pure, you are righteous, okay? It's not how religious you are when cross around your neck and being affiliated with some church structure. No, it has everything to do with the fact you have integrity, the fact that you're honest, the fact that you are loving your kind it is by your ways they will know, by your love, okay? And so two main characters, which I didn't get to, but don't worry, we got time. <laughs> I want to talk to you about sin and what that sin and how it happened. We got we to gotta get into that. And then we got to talk about Noah, the, one of the most underestimated great people you know he gets overshadowed he gets I mean, we got to talk about noah we could not want you matter of fact i tell you what i want you to go back and read that again i want you to read it over again after what i just told you all right because i'm gonna tell you as you understand this and as we go through this you're going it's all gonna start to make sense not just in the fact that it happened a long time ago but all of a sudden you're going to realize, oh, so that's what God is doing in my life right now. Father, thank you. Thank you because we need to connect with the almighty God, the God who created the heavens and the earth. That God has called me. What manner of love God as Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children. God, man, what an honor, what a privilege to be on assignment, amen, to be a royal priest of a holy nation. Thank you, Lord, as we go through our day to day, Lord, allow us to walk with a sense of purpose and meaning and fulfilling your call. Thank you for the generation washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit and that we're walking in our purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man out. Man out.